Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for uh, getting uh, our Cambodia team back safely, Lord God. Um, thank you so much for the, the, the lessons you have taught us. Thank you so much, God, for the, uh, for the journey and uh, the struggles and the hurts. Father God, we want to pray that uh, while we are here now coming back, Father, that you would just give us um, a passion, Lord, to really proclaim uh, what, you have sh- what you have shown us personally over there. Really proclaim, Father God, the word. the truth, and Lord, um, uh, the work that needs to be done. I want to pray, Father God, over TLC uh, this afternoon as well. Would you continue to bless our brothers and sisters? We want to thank you so much, Father, for their support and their hand that helped send us, Lord. And I want to pray, God, that today in your word, Lord, help us to be reminded that we are battling, that we are in a battle day in a day, day in and day out with a force that we cannot see, but a force desiring to destroy us, Lord God. Help us to be awakened to that. Help us to remind ourselves of that. Help us, God, to, uh, to know what to do and how to overcome it. We thank you so much, Father. We want to pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, man, let me tell you, about, let me tell you one story, okay, about uh, Cambodia, okay? Um, so, the first, thing, the first thing we actually did in Cambodia was we built... this fence. We didn't even build a fence. We just basically dug 26 holes, okay? We dug 26 holes, like about, you know, uh, about a foot and a half in, right? A foot and a half deep and probably a foot and a half out, okay? And digging holes is not as easy as I thought, okay? Those are freaking hard holes to dig, okay? Add in the humidity, add in the heat, it was, it was a long day, okay? It was a long day, but, you know, it was fun, you know, digging the holes, having fun, drinking water, and we thought everything was going to go okay. And the moment after we finished digging the holes, it took us about from Uh, nine in the morning all the way to about four in the afternoon to finish, right? Uh, all those holes. And after we were done, basically half of my team died, okay? And I say died, I literally meant they were just out of commission, right? That, that was on a Saturday. That was on a Saturday, right before Sunday when we, need, when we needed a few of the members. Like, Kun was supposed to be my translator, okay? My Vietnamese translator. I spoke in English for the message. Kun was supposed to translate. She was out. And when she was out, she was like 104 degrees Uh, temperature, right? It was crazy. Like, she couldn't even stand. We had to carry her everywhere, okay? It was 140 degrees temperature. Brother Evan had to uh, lead the Bible study, right? And he was out. Like, there was, there was, we caught some weird bacteria or something out there, and he couldn't move, right, from his spot, okay? And we're like, oh, man, this is bad. This is bad. So that, that was, and then on Monday, and so that was bad already. On Monday, when we started, supposed to start, start teaching English, okay, The moment, and you know, Annie is our sister who teaches, you know, help us teach English. She knocked out on Monday, okay? And I was like, man, this is going to be the hardest week ever. Like, everyone that we needed like, kept getting knocked out whenever we needed them, right? And it was just sickness after sickness. There were, like, just we had the runs the constantly, right? We moved, and we had to go. It was just really, really bad, okay? And I was, uh, you know, the team and I, we sat down. We were just thinking, you know, what's going on? What is going on? I mean, of course, probably ate something bad, right? But what is going on? How come, like, how come it, was, it, was, it got to such a point where everyone just said, we just want to go home, right? It got to a point where everyone in mindset was like, they, they, they didn't voice it to me verbally, but you can see it on our faces, right? Like, I think it's time to go home, right? It's like, we barely did one day's worth of work, and we're like, it's time to go home, right? It was just so painful, okay? And we were just praying about it. We were just like, you know, why is this happening? What's going on? And... You know, we, we thought about it, and, and the idea was this, that, that came forth as through our prayers was, you know, we, we are the pioneering team for TLC's missions, right, uh, for EM. TL, first team that went off to missions for our church. And the number one way for us to not go back ever again, right, is to basically completely discourage us in any way possible to never come back again. And that was one, that, that could have... In my mind, I was like, physically, I wasn't, like, I, I was still in pain. But mentally, I was thinking, that's it, dude. This is, if anything, this would be the one, this would be the way that we will never come back again. Because it was just emotionally discouraging. It was physically discouraging, spiritually discouraging, right? And we just begin to doubt why we're here. We begin to ask questions and what was the point of all this, right? And the reminder came that we are, we are in a battle, TLCs, we're, we're going on missions. God does, the devil doesn't want us to go on missions. He doesn't, he doesn't want for his, the word of God to begin to move forward in any way possible. And so what does he want to do? He wants to make it stop before it gets anywhere, right? 
and he'll do it. And, and he did it through really taking out our team one by one. Whenever we need someone, boom, that person was out. Whenever need, someone needed to stand up, boom, that person was taken out. Right? I kept, I was, there was a running joke that I kept playing like, in, our, in, in our group. Every day when someone was, when someone was knocked out, I said, and then there was five. And then there was four, right? Four was the lowest number we got to, okay? Four was the lowest number we got to, but it was bad. It was bad. And today, I want to share with us about this. I want to share with us the idea of spiritual battles, okay? I want us to see that from Scripture today, I want to see that the devil is indeed after us. If you call yourself a son and daughter of God, the devil is after you, okay? There's no doubt about it. He is after you. And there's an unseen, powerful force that wants to destroy you. Okay? One way or the other. I want, us to see that. I, want us, I want us to see what he's throwing at us. What are the things that he uses to take us out? What are the things that he, he does to be able to render us useless in his kingdom? Right? I want us to see the deadly lethal weapons he can use to ruin us spiritually. Okay? And thirdly, I want us to see what are our defenses on that. How can we protect ourselves from him? See, if you call yourself a son and daughter of God, one way or another, one form or another, one time or another, the devil is going to come after you. Right? There is a spiritual unseen force that is very powerful that is going to do anything and everything possible to come in and render you useless. This is actually how you know. This is actually how you know that you are a child of God. If you can go through life without an, a, a, any moment of spiritual battle in your life, any spiritual uh, struggles in your life, you know that probably... You're not a threat to him, right? But when you see spiritual battles happening in you, when you see the forces coming against you, when you see these things happening to you, right, it's a reminder, I'm in a battle, right? And I need to be prepared. Okay, so three things. I want us to see that the devil is after us, that he is very powerful. I want us to see what he's using to come and attack us spiritually. Because the only way to take out a Christian Because he can't basically bring us back to inside, right? The only way to take out a Christian is basically to render him or her useless. To put them in a spiritual coma, okay? So I want us to see what he's throwing at us to make that happen. I want us to see what defenses we have to protect ourselves from that. So open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to get started, okay? Ephesians chapter 6. We have an enemy of immense power, superior intelligence, who has the specific goal of murdering us spiritually. He intensely hates us and uses whatever schemes possible to stop us or destroy us. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 12. Let's read that first two verses first, okay? If you don't have your Bibles, you can put it up here, okay? Read it up there. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So you have an enemy, okay, who will do anything he can to destroy you. He despises you. See, if you are a Christian, you have an enemy that will do anything and everything possible to render you useless. He hates you. He hates who you are. He hates what you do. He hates what you've become. And he will do anything he can to destroy you. And the reason he hates you is this. Okay? Because you have rebelled against him. The reason why the devil hates you so deeply is because you have rebelled against him. You have turned yourself from calling him Lord to finding a Lord that is good and true. Christ our Lord. You've been saved by loving Christ. You have eternal life. And you have forever said No to Satan. And so he despises the fact that you are no longer his. He hates it. But he's not just going to leave. He's he's just not not just going to pout about it. He's not just going to whine and complain, oh, okay, I lost him. No. If he's lost you over to God, this is one thing he'll do. He will render you useless in God's kingdom. He will render you useless forever in the kingdom of God. He will make it so that you will be in a spiritual coma for the majority of your Christian walk. Because why? Because, look, he knows. He knows you've been won over, right? He knows that now you're a threat to him. You experience what life is. 
life away from him, right? And he knows that you have the potential of bringing other people over. And so you become a threat to him. And so the only way that he can do now, what he can do now for you is to render you useless in God's kingdom. To render you completely useless in God's kingdom. And he's deadly serious about doing this, right? That's what Paul says in verse 11. He says this, put on the full armor, right, um, of God so that you, can, that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. See, so when he says our struggle, this is a picture of someone choking you, right? Someone's choking you and you're strangling to get out of that. That's our struggle. So the devil is coming at you and he's holding on to you. And he wants to take you out of this, out of commissions. You have an enemy who is intent to destroy you. And his ability to do that is almost beyond comprehension. Okay? If you guys have never undergone a spiritual struggle, a spiritual attack in your life, right? There's a good indication that maybe, there's a good indication that maybe he doesn't have to worry too much about you. Right? That he doesn't have to worry too much about what you're doing because probably what you're doing is not uh, in any way uh, damaging to him. But the moment, the moment you decide to do something for the kingdom of God, to initiate something, the battle is real. The struggle is real, right? As we, like, we say it nowadays, the struggle is real, right? You know, TLC, when we decided to pioneer a mission for the first time, I've been in missions before. Missions was never hard. Okay, for me, in terms of like physically and spirit, mentally, it was never, never as difficult, right? This is the first mission where it was actually mentally very difficult for me. I was, I was constantly in my head the whole time, like trying to figure out what was going on. Because like I've never experienced a, a time when my, half my team was out of commission before, right? And the other half was like, we have no idea what we're doing, okay? And we just winged it most of the time, okay? Never, okay? And I was just, what was going on? What was going on? And I know it's because mostly... Because of this. He's intent on destroying you. And his ability to do it is unbelievable. Okay? He has an immense power to make this happen. Let me tell you verse 12. Look at verse 12. Our struggle, which means our battle to the death, is not just something like, our, you know, like, oh, it's hard for me. Like, our battle to the death is not against flesh and blood. It's, against, it's not against ordinary human enemies or ordinary human powers. That's what it's saying, right? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. Your struggle is against an enemy who has a global ability to force his will. He has the power on a worldwide scale to compel obedience. See, Jesus called him the ruler of this world. Paul calls him the God of this world, the prince of power of the air. John, uh, the apostle John calls him the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The devil has complete power over this world. And now this evil ruler with worldwide power is coming after you. He, he can pretty much make anything happen to you that he wants to. And what's his power, okay? What's his power? What can he do against you if he wanted to? Okay, firstly, a couple of things. Okay, first, what are some of his powers? If he thought it would work, he would use his power to bring the forces of nature against you. Right? The forces of nature against you. You know, the book of Job tells us Right? What happens? He, he used exactly that. He used lightning, right, to burn down um, Job's barns and corrals, destroy his livestock. He uses a hurricane to level uh, his family's home and crush the people living in it. Right? He uses, have you guys ever, like, you know, like you're studying and you're, you, you have this huge project that you have to turn in and you're typing away, right? And you know that you have to finish it or else, you know, you're in deep trouble. And you know, you, and you know that if you can't finish it, you're going to have to, like, copy off somebody. And you're, you're in this kind of, like, um, on this bind, like, I don't want to copy. I don't want to make. I don't want to like totally plagiarize. So I got. I got to like write this paper out. And the moment you're almost done with the paper, this is back then uh, when it's uh, before auto save, right? The power went out. Has that ever happened to you? That happened to me a couple times, right? Power goes out, and you're just looking at your screen. You're like, please tell me I press Control S. Please say I press Control S, right? That's all I'm saying. Please tell me I press Control S. The power comes back on, and you've lost the majority of your paper, and you're just. You're just upset. You're angry, right? Um, you're wondering what's going on. Right? You're, 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 you, you have every intention now, right, to do anything possible, finish this paper. You're, you're led to temptation to want to plagiarize now, right? 
See, Satan is the god of this world, the prince of power of the air. He, if he thought it would work, he would use the power to bring the forces of nature against you. Accidents could happen to you. Things could break down or malfunction in your home, right, when you need it the most. He could also use his power to physically affect your body, which I think what he did during our, our missions. If he thought it would get at you, he would go after your body, broken bones, diseases, illness, fatigue, right? He infected Job with a skin disease, right? A skin disease that covered his whole body and was so contagious, Job um, had to quarantine himself for weeks because of it. See, if he could, if he, could, if he thought it would work on you, he would use whatever power in his in his um, arsonry to throw at you. If it was nature, he would throw nature at you. If he knew that throwing, cutting off the power would totally mess you up, he would totally do it. If he, if he knew that fires or hurricanes would actually, would actually render you useless, he would use that against you. If he knew that illness right, would render you useless, he would use that against you. He can affect your body. He can use forces of nature. He can also play with your mind and influence people's thoughts, your thoughts. Influence your thoughts, influence how people think about you, or turn people against you. He has the power to insinuate himself into people's thinking and make them behave in certain ways. Right? In the book of Job, Satan puts into the mind of a band of hooligans to attack Job's farmers while they're plowing in his field and steal his animals. Right? If Satan thought it would destroy you, listen, if Satan thought that it would destroy you, he would turn your boss against you. Right? Or make your fellow worker dislike you. Or cause your teacher to have a poor opinion of you. He can influence thoughts. Satan has incredible power over nature, over bodies, inside minds. He can pretty much do anything he wants to get at you. But not only is he powerful, he's smart. Not only is he powerful, he's smart. Look at verse 11. He says this. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He's smart. He knows exactly where to hit you when to hit you, and how to hit you. He knows that sometimes physicality won't mess you up. Right? Like, for example, for me, right? Like, physical stuff that comes, happens to me, I'm a pretty big guy, so I, like, I, that doesn't bother me much. But the thing that bothers me the most is, like, mental things, right? Like, if he messes with my brain, right, I get, I get screwed up really easily. Like, I, I don't mind the toilets. I don't mind how bad, like, you know, the condi- living conditions are. But if he messes with me, like, mentally, I kind of break down. Like, I'm like, what's going on, right? Physical, sometimes physical power, physical attacks won't, won't do you any problem. Sometimes the, 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 the idea is right, he'll attack you. He knows exactly where to attack you, when to attack you, how to attack you, right? Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, he knows where to attack you. He knows your weak points. He knows which one to come at you with, right? For some of you guys, it could be a struggle with sex, right? For some of you, it could be a, a tremendous desire to advance your career. So he knows that the best way to attack you is to mess with your career. To mess with the way of getting you either to get promoted or demoted. To mess with your career. For some of you guys, it could be the preoccupation over money. He knows how deeply worried you are whether you have enough or not enough. Whether you are um, completely okay with the amount of money you have or you're always worried about the money you have. He knows that and he constantly uses that against you. Right? Some of you guys, he knows that you have this humongous desire to be loved. This humongous desire to be liked. And so he would, he would cause your friends, he would attack you where, um, where you would feel like, you know, you are no longer loved. Where you are no longer appreciated. He would attack you where you would feel the most hurt. That's his attack. He knows where to attack you. But he also knows when to attack you. Right? He knows when to hit you. Like, for example, this is one of the best times he hits you. He hits you when you're tired from a long day's work, right? Some of you guys, like, after a long day's work, you don't want to do anything, right? You don't want to have anything happen. You just want to just veg out, sit on your couch. But that's when he comes. That's when he comes and he messes with your brain. Car accidents happen or, like, you know, you, you, you come back home from a long day's worth of work. And then you get all these phone calls of people like, you know, you get these Facebook messages of all these people saying, hey, man, something's going on, blah, blah, blah. And you're all upset and you're angry with people, right? He knows exactly when to hit you. Long days worth of work, right? Or this, when you're discouraged because nothing is going right. You, you've done everything possible and nothing is going right. Nothing is going right. Nothing is going well for you, okay? You, you, you thought that things are... Uh, he thought that as long as I just keep doing the right thing, things should get better for me, but nothing's going right. That's when he attacks you. 
right? Or when no one appreciates the efforts you're making or has any gratitude for what you do for them, right? So here you are, you're working, you're working your butt off, and no one's appreciating it. No one's, and, and, and it causes your mind to start thinking. It causes you to start having these bitter feelings. He started, he started, he started making you feel like, you know what, uh, angry inside, right? Isolating yourself away from everyone. Or uh, he hits you when um, you've been turned down for a job, a school, or a date, right? Something that you've been really being for and hoping to get, and all of a sudden it stops, right? And you're just really discouraged by that. Or when you're alone or been taken advantage of. See, the devil, he knows where to attack you. He knows what your weak points are, right? He knows when to attack you, and then he knows how to attack you, okay? He knows how to attack you. He can use someone in your family as a means of getting at you, right? You know, like uh, I was talking to the pastor over there, and he told us a lot of stories about when he first started off, how, how much, like, struggles he had to go through. And this is one thing he said as a pastor. He said this. He said, the one way Satan attacks a pastor is through his family, right? Like, everyone else, the pastor can just kind of brush off. But when Satan attacks his family, his wife, his children, it makes the pastor pause on what he's doing. Right? It makes the pastor's pause on what he's doing. He says that's the number one way to attack a pastor. He can use someone in your family as a means of getting at you. He can use your best friend, even another Christian who really thinks he has your best interest at heart, right, to come at you. He can entice you with what, he, what looks like the most attractive, reasonable, advantageous, beneficial thing you ever thought of. Right? That's what he did with, um, um, with Eve, right? That this is the best thing possible? All right, let me, let me summarize up to this point, okay? There is an evil force. I know that we don't talk about this much often, right? Because we kind of just kind of roll with life, little kind of deal. But there is, if you are, God of, if you are a son of God, a daughter of God, there is an evil, powerful force against you. He is against you because you have rebelled against him. You were on his side, and you crossed over the line. You decided, I will be a son of God. You've experienced a new life, and you have now this ability and this desire to bring everyone you know over to the side. He hates you. You have rebelled against him, and he is now going to render you useless. He's going to do everything in his power to discourage you, to mess with you, to make your, uh, to make your body basically into this spiritual coma where you will be as useless as possible to the church, to your family, to the people around you. He will make you spiritually useless. And what does he do? He knows exactly where to hit you. For some of us, it is family. For some of us, it's sex. For some of us, it's money. For some of us, it's jobs. For some of us, it's security. For some of us, it's, uh, it's work. It's friends. He knows exactly when to hit you, when you're tired, when you're discouraged, when you have, when you've done everything you thought was supposed to be right and no one appreciates it. He knows exactly when to hit you. He knows exactly how to hit you. He uses your family. He uses your best friend. He, he brings an option to your life that you thought, this is the best possible option for me. But it ends up being a trap when you walk into it. See, he knows which schemes will work best for you. So what are they? What are some of the schemes that he'll use, right? Paul goes on to mention some of the schemes he may use, and here are some of the ways he, uh, he will use his power and intelligence to attack and destroy you spiritually. So what are these things? What are these things specifically that he would use to take you out, okay? First of all, verse uh, 13, right? Verse 13, Paul says, no, no, no. Verse 14, sorry, verse 14, it says this, okay? One scheme that Satan will use, one approach to ruin you spiritually that he finds effective is to get you to lie. He will tempt you to shade the truth and thereby descend into darkness. He will get you to lie. Look at verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Okay? The temptation to lie might come on the job. Okay? You want to close a sale. Right? Here you are. You're, you're, making, you're trying to make the sale and you want to close the sale. You want to lie to get your closing, to, 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 uh, to make it happen, to get a new client. Right? To make a high quota, to lie, to pacify your demanding boss, to put, a, to put off a critical coworker. One of the schemes in which the devil gets you 
to fall spiritually useless so he gets you to lie. So temptation might come at home. You may lie to cover your tracks. Where you been, honey? Um, out with my buddy, right? To avoid a phone call, you'll lie. Or you'll lie to get out of doing something, right? He may get you to lie about your age, your resume, who did your homework, where you went or where you were with, who you were with and what you did. He knows how to put the pressure on to get us to lie, to destroy us spiritually. That's why we need to protect ourselves, right? That's why we need to protect ourselves. That's why Paul says you got to do what? Verse 13, put on the full armor of God so that when a day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you've done everything to stand, okay? And what do you stand with? This is the first thing, verse 14. You stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, okay? You got to arm yourself. And as Paul begins to talk about this, he begins to say, he, he has this picture of a Roman soldier. I was watching this movie, Pompeii, on the, on the plane, right? And there's this picture of this, this, um, this Roman soldier, a, a belt of truth. A, a Roman belt is like this six-inch belt. It's kind of like those weightlifting belts. You guys have been seen those weightlifting belts? You tie it around your waist. It's meant to keep your core tight, right? Keep you strong in your core, right? And so this, this, um, this belt, is put, you're supposed to put this belt of truth around you. And since one of Satan's scheme is to get us to lie, the first thing we need to do to arm ourselves is with with the belt of truth, which is this, a commitment, right? An invincible conviction to tell the truth, no matter what. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, right? Your first weapon against Satan's attempt to ruin you, to draw you into darkness, is an unshakable conviction to tell the truth. That's hard, isn't it? tell the truth, to, to, to want to tell the truth, especially, but, but in, 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 the, in the prospect, with the prospect of having people turn against you or having to lose this deal, to tell the truth, right, even when you know you're going to get in trouble, right, to tell the truth when, when you know that if you tell the truth, you know, your wife might get mad at you, right, to tell the truth when you know that um, you, you might not actually get that promotion that you wanted, See, the, the one scheme, you guys, one of the schemes in which the devil uses to turn himself, turn you spiritually useless, slowly. And it's never quick. It's always slow, okay? To turn you spiritually useless in a spiritual coma is to get you to lie. And it's like, what's, what's so wrong about a lie here and there, right? It adds up, you guys. After a while, a lie here and there adds up to a lie everywhere, right? If you can get away with it, you will lie. If you can get ahead, you will lie. If you can make an excuse for it, you would lie. And so the first thing that Paul says is put on the belt of truth. Have this overwhelming, invincible conviction to tell the truth, to be truth givers. There's another scheme that Satan uses against us. Sometimes he's truly, he's truly aware that another way will work with us is to ruin us spiritually, is to do this, is to get us to act immorally. Right? To make us uh, question our character. To act, make us act unrighteously or impurely. Right? I'll give you a couple of examples. He make, he'll make our computers unexpectedly link up with a porn site. Right? And cause us to linger there. Like, oh, hey, it popped up. What do I do? Right? And then, you know, and, and, and then also we remember the site for some reason. We can't remember, like, our phone numbers, but we remember that site. Right? And to sneak other looks here and there. And to plan times alone at home or at work where one, no, when no one is aware... And suddenly we find ourselves caught and compelled and descending into darkness. He'll tempt us to act unrighteously, right? To pout, to whine, to complain, to constantly argue, to make excuses, to break promises, to get really pissed off for no apparent reason. He'll make it sound exciting and daring to shoplift, to steal, to copy, at wor- to copy work at school or sneak supplies from the office, Right? One of the second schemes in which Satan uses to get us to render us completely useless God's kingdom is this, to make us unrighteous, to get us to act unrighteously, to damage our character, okay? And that's why in verse 14 he says what? We need to cover ourselves with the protection of righteousness. What is that? Verse 14, put, uh, buckle the, uh, around your waist, right, with the, with the blessed breastplate of righteousness in place, right? Buckle around your waist 
with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Uh, a Roman breast, uh, breastplate. I can't even speak English. Uh, uh, a Roman breastplate is this. It's kind of these, these little like, uh, squares, right, with a little circle inside, and they overlap each other. And they're, and they're basically sewn into a leather vest behind that. And basically, they're very flexible, but there's no way that you can enter it, right? There's, there's no, no, um, no penetrating point that you can go, right? They're, they overlap one another over and over. And so because of that, they're very flexible. They can move back and forth, but also at the same time, they're impenetrable, okay? Um, and that's our protection. It's a commitment to righteousness, to always do the right thing. See, your character, no one can take your character away from you. Character is the one thing that you can give away. No one can take it from you. You understand that? No one can take your character from you. No one, no one can force you to do the wrong thing, to do what's unrighteous. No one can do that. Only you can push yourself to make it happen. Only you can get yourself, right, to act more. Only you can get yourself to, to lie, to steal. Only you can get yourself to copy, to steal, to get upset, to whine, to complain, to argue. Only you can get yourself to a place where you are damaging your own character, right? And so when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, what Paul is saying is this, be convicted. Be convicted, right? A commitment to righteous living, to do right. To do right when everyone else around you is telling you to do wrong. To do right when the crowd around you says, it's okay, it's not a big deal. Just go and do it. It's not, no, one, no one's going no to think any worse of you. Everyone here is doing it. But for you to stand and say, no, I will not. Right? There's a third scheme, though, that Satan uses. A third way of ruining a believer's life. He'll attack our relationships. Right? If he can't break you with truth or penetrate you or penetrate your righteous character, he'll try to ruin your relationships. He'll create bitterness anger um, with, between you and another person or another believer. Hurts will occur. Distrust will develop. Distance will grow. He will make it so that you and someone else will have this kind of falling out. Okay? The hurt might come from a time when we were publicly put down or humiliated. Maybe someone humiliates you in public. They didn't mean to, but they probably did it in public. Right? And it hurts. Or from a time when we overlooked, or when we were overlooked and being selected or chosen. You know, it, I thought it was, you know, my time, but, you know, they just kind of overlooked us. From a time when we get criticized, right? The pain may come from someone who is disloyal, right? Ambitious or weak or envious with us. We tell ourselves it doesn't matter, right? It's not a big deal, but you know it is because why? You have that bitter anger in you, right? You, you, you hold that bitterness inside of you. It, it kind of just festers there. It doesn't go away. You say, oh, it's not a big deal, whatever, I'm done with it. I'm over it, but you know you're not over it. The fact that you say you're over it, you know you're not over it, right? It's there. It's hiding. And one of the ways in which the devil schemes to render you useless in his kingdom as a Christian, right, is to attack your relationships. He will make it so that you will be bitter with people, angry with people, unforgiving with people. He will make it so that you become unloyal to people, Right? He attacks us. And so what do we need? What do we need? Look at verse 15. And with your feet fitted with the, read, with, read, with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, we need to take the steps to talk it out, to forgive, to walk in peace. Right? To be peacemakers. See, so you, you mess with his schemes. You mess with his schemes when your feet, right, has a readiness to make peace. When you're ready to make peace. Let me tell you, let me tell you this idea, right? When you and someone has been like, angry with each other for a long time, and you just constantly, you, you know you're right, right? And they know they're right. And you're both arguing against each other, and both of you guys aren't letting down. What's going to happen? There's going to be that constant clash over and over and over. No one's going to back down, right? But you know when they back down? You know when that person basically back down? It's when you make peace. When you swallow your pride, you swallow the fact of you being right, you swallow that and you make peace. All right? You make peace. It's hard, isn't it? 
it's hard to make peace with people, especially when, when you know in your heart that you're probably right most of the time, right? Or you think you're right most of the time. And for, and for you to say, why do I have to swallow my pride? They should swallow their pride and make peace with me, right? You never expect that. You ought to be the one that does it first. You swallow your pride. You say, hey, let's make this work. Let's make peace. Right? You apologize. Right? You make it happen. You win them over with kindness. Right? You beat them down with kindness. Right? You get them into repentance with kindness. That's how the devil attacks. If you are a son and daughter of God, okay? If you are a son and daughter of God, he wants to make you useless. Because he doesn't like what you're doing. He doesn't like the fact that you're living, you're, you're, you're growing in a new life. He doesn't like the fact that we're going on missions. He doesn't like the fact that we're doing discipleship. He doesn't like the fact that we're trying to grow this church spiritually. He doesn't like that fact. And so what will he do? All right, what schemes will he put on? What power will he use use to get you to lie? To get you to act unrighteously? To mess with your character? To mess with your relationships? He will use any and every one of those things to render you useless. But here's the fourth one. Here's the fourth one. It's the the strongest one. It's it's the one thing he attacks you with that actually makes those three uh, armors completely useless. Okay? There's one thing he attacks you with that will make those armors completely useless. Verse 16, he talks about this. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Flaming arrows. He attacks us with flaming arrows. This is one of the last attacks that he uses. And if he, and if he gets us with it, no matter how much peace you have, no matter how, how convicted to the truth you are, no matter how great your character may be, no matter how strong a peace you want to make, if he attacks you with the flaming arrow, most likely you will give in and it will render you useless. Because in, in, in war, a Roman soldier during war, right? A flaming arrow is basically an enemy takes an arrow, dips it in tar, lights it up, and shoots it at the, at the Roman soldier. Now, the tar is basically, it oozes. It has this liquid kind of thing. And if it gets under the belt, what happens? It's going to burn your internal organ because that thing protects your whole entire stomach, right? But if it gets under there, so tar gets under there, it starts melting through your, your body, right? It starts killing your stomach, starts um, burning uh, into your, 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 your body, right? If it gets across your breastplate, see, it's liquid, right? It's kind of liquidness. So it has this ability to do what? Penetrate. Right? Maybe a sword can't penetrate, but what? Liquid can. And if that, that, that oozy tar gets into it, that breastplate will become useless. Right? And what happens if that tar hits your feet? It burns your feet, and you just basically fall down anyways. Right? So these flaming arrows that the devil throws, this is his last, his last attack that will render those three weapons useless. What do we have to... Uh, what, actually, what is this flaming arrow? What is the flaming arrow? What is this weapon? What does the flaming arrow mean? The flaming arrow that penetrates is the thought that you cannot trust the goodness of, that, of God. The flaming arrow is doubt in God. That's his last attack. He throws doubt into you. He throws doubt at you. You begin to doubt in the goodness of God. Doubt that God really cares about me. Doubt that God can actually love me. That he's tenderly watching over me. Doubt that no matter how bad things are looking around me, that God is still in control of my life. Doubt that God is actually looking out for my well-being. Doubt right, that everything's going to come out okay for me in the end. Doubt in the goodness of God. You see, Satan uses the flaming arrow in the Garden of Eden. Did he not? In the Garden of Eden, what, ha- what happened? He asked he asked Eve, can you eat anything you want in this garden? Eve says, yes, we can't eat anything we want except from the tree there, the tree that will give us certain kind of knowledge. If we eat from that tree, we'll die. And what does the snake say? You won't die. So the reason God said that, you, that to you is because he knows if you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like him, knowing the things he knows. And he doesn't want you to know that. He doesn't want to share that with you. He isn't, really, he, he isn't really giving you everything that he could. He isn't really committed to you. You can't really trust him to do what's best for you. And so what does Eve do? Okay, she takes it and she eats it. Doubt. 
the penetrating arrow of doubt, doubt in the goodness of God. And if that arrow hits and sticks, the other defenses will weaken, right? If that arrow hits you and it sticks to you, if you begin to question and doubt God's goodness, it begins to mess with you. It begins to mess with your commitment to tell the truth, right? See, if I lost my job and our finances are getting desperate, if I do not believe that God will be good, then truth will give way and I will, and I will pad my resume. I will lie on my resume, right? So that I can get a job to get a better job because I'm desperate. Because I don't trust that God is actually good for me. See, if I have business, if, if I've uh, had business reverses, stock market loses, retirement fears, and I don't believe that I can trust the goodness of God, then truthfulness will weaken and I will make the tax form say what I wanted to say so that I can get an extra return out of it. So I can lie on my taxes. You see, if you don't trust in the goodness of God, you begin to do what? Lie. Right? See, if that flaming arrow of doubt in the goodness of God hits and sticks, the commitment of truth will not hold. See, if that arrow hits and sticks, the commitment of righteousness will give away also. See, if you do not believe that God will be good, why bother to live purely? See, if I want someone to marry and share my life with, but I can't trust God to bring that person to me, that I may act immorally to get what I want. I might make up excuses to get what I want, right? I, may, I, I might do all these things to actually end up getting to this person, even though, because I don't trust that God actually has someone planned for my life, which reminds me, okay? Trust me, you guys. If God can create the whole entire universe, he can find you a husband and a wife, okay? He can find you a husband and a wife. Don't jump the gun so quickly. Or this, if I've just broken up with someone, with that one person that was everything I ever wanted, then where is God's goodness? Why should I care about staying pure, right? We begin to question that. If my husband or my wife is not attentive to me, not responsive to me, and I, and I do not believe that God is committed to good in my life, then I will find myself looking for some, my, my joy and satisfaction in someone else. You see, if you do not trust in the goodness of God, if you find yourself if, if doubt begins to hit your heart and you begin to not trust in God's goodness of your life, what happens? Truth will fade. You're going to end up lying. You know that, right? If you know that God's not going to be good for you, you're not going to be wanting to tell the truth. Because you know if you tell the truth, you, in your mind, like, will, will things actually get good for me if I tell the truth? I don't trust that God's going to actually make things better for me. So I'm going to lie and make things better for me, myself, right? Or if, or if, you don't trust that God's good for you, you you're going to question, you're going to act with questionable character. You know, honestly, is God really good for me? Right? Let me, let me do my thing. Let me do my thing. Let me act the way I want to act. Right? Because I'm pretty sure God's not good for me. Right? He can't be good for me. Right? He, he, I end up breaking up with the person I really loved. Right? What good is that? I might as well just jump into any other relationship I, I can. Right? See, if the flaming arrow hits and sticks, the commitment to righteousness will not hold. And lastly, if that arrow hits and sticks, the commitment to peace will be abandoned. Right? Peace. The, the, the shoes of peace. If the friend I trusted was disloyal, if the Christian who hired me wounded me, if the believer I did business with cheated me, if God's people seem no better than unbelievers, and if I think that God's goodness can't show up even within his own family then I will put up a wall to protect myself against others and have this mentality. It's every man for himself, right? Every man for himself. If I can't trust that God's good to me, then I'll never open myself or be vulnerable again because I don't want to get hurt again. And the commitment to peace and loving relationship will give way. You guys know that, right? If I don't trust that God is good to me, I'm not going to try to make peace with people. I'm going to put up walls. I'm going to put this distrust between me and that person. I'm going to always question what they're going to do. I'm always going to question their action, their attitude. I'm going to live my life with every man for himself. If you do good for me, I'll do good for you. But it's never the other way. It's never this mentality where if you do bad to me, I will still do good to you. Because why? I don't believe that God's going to use my goodness for any reason. I don't believe that my God is good enough to do anything good in this situation. You see... The number one weapon in which God attacks you with, listen to me, guys. The number one weapon in which God attacks you with is this. It's doubt. He makes, not God, did I say God? No. Satan, right? It's God. Sorry. Right? <laughs> Satan, the number one weapon in which Satan uses to attack you with is 
doubt against the goodness of God. It's doubt. I'm still jet lagged, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm surprised I'm still speaking right now, right? It's, um, it's doubt against God's goodness. Doubt in the goodness of God is Satan's most powerful weapon. And the enemy will, who hates you will shoot flaming arrows heading your way, penetrating the thought you cannot trust God to be good to you. And if that thought sticks, he will have destroyed you spiritually, right? He will render you useless when you have come to his place in your heart where you believe that God is not good for you. That God is not, this, when someone dies in your family, and you say, how can this be possibly be good? And you begin to doubt the goodness of God, you begin to act in a way the devil wins. He has rendered you useless. Can you believe that? Can you ever even come to mind that every, every pain that you have ever and will ever encounter in your life, God does not waste such a pain. He does not waste a single tear that you have. But he will use it and he will take it and he will mold it into an act of righteousness, an act of goodness. He will do something good out of it. No pain is wasted in God. But when you begin to doubt, you begin to lose. Because the devil has taken hold of your heart. You guys understand that? All right? And what is our protection against the flaming arrow? All right? It's the shield of faith. Look at verse 16 one last time. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming evils of all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield, the Roman shield, there's two types of shield. There's a garbage can shield that they use, which is like the circular shield, right? Which is pretty cool, but it basically just covers you, right? Or it's the uh, it's the door frame uh, shield. It's this really big old block shield like this, right? And you make a phalanx out of it, and basically whatever arrows they shoot, it's, it's covered with leather and it's, and it's oiled up. So whatever um, arrows they shoot at you, it just basically slides off. Slides off easily, right? Nothing, no arrow can come at you, and especially when there's all the whole army of, of the Roman uh, so, legions, they come, they put that shield up, this huge, humongous uh, wooden door frame shield. There's two huge planks that they put up, blocks you completely. Whatever arrow comes at you, no way to penetrate you, right? That's our shield. In addition to all this, above all, as a protection above all others, Take up the shield of faith, right? What is faith? Faith in the goodness of God. Faith that he really cares about you, that he loves you, that he's tenderly watching over you. Faith that he's working things for good in your life. You understand that? Faith that he's working things for good in your life, that he's going to make things come out okay for you. Faith that, he's, that he unendingly has your best interest at heart. Faith in the goodness of God. That faith protects the rest of my armor and enables me to resist the schemes of Satan. Let me give you a couple of things. If the belt of truth is protected by that shield, I will resist the temptation to lie. It might look something like this. Lord, money is tight. There are reasons to be concerned. I'm not sure what we're going to do, but I believe that you are good, that you see us and will take care of us And I will walk with truth and integrity as I wait for your blessing. Money is tight. But I'm not going to lie my way so that I can make more money. I'm going to wait and trust, living and walking in integrity, knowing that you are a good God, that you are not going to abandon me financially. See, if the belt of truth is protected, I will resist the temptation to lie. I um, I will also resist the temptation to act immorally. Lord, I want someone wonderful to share my life with. You haven't yet brought that person to me. I don't see anything on the horizon either, but I believe that you are good. And when that day comes, I will offer the one you have chosen a gift of purity, a gift of love, all for them. I will wait, and I will trust. One of the main reasons why a lot of you guys just jump into relationships over and over is because, honestly, you guys don't trust that God has someone actually good for you. Right? But you don't trust that God actually has someone good for you and you, and you, and you basically ba- um, compromise your integrity, you compromise your character, you compromise yourself so that you can have this relationship thinking that it's going to be good. 
rather than just saying, Lord, I will trust and I will wait, that you have someone good for me. That you have, a, you have a woman that you are preparing at this very moment for me. That you have a man that you are preparing, a man, okay? A man, ladies, at this moment preparing for me, right? See, if, if the shoes of peace is protected, right, you will make peace. Lord, your people failed me and they hurt me. Right? Because of their fears or struggles or pride, they have wounded me. But I believe that you are good. You are my rewarder. Your plans for me are good. And therefore, I will walk in peace with those who hurt me. I will speak gently, softly, knowing that it is my kindness, not my anger, or my retaliation that will draw them to repentance. Right? See, if you know that God is good, you're not going to try to fight, put up walls, every man for himself. But you're actually going to make peace. You're going to act in kindness. And it's through kindness that you bring people over. And this is our protection, the shield of faith. Faith in the goodness of God. Faith that things are not out of control. Faith that God's loving hands are shaping my life. Faith in whatever happens with my health, you are working something good. Faith that whatever is happening at my work, you have good plans for me. Faith that whatever... Um, it's happening with my husband and my wife. There are good days ahead. Regardless of my foolishness, regardless of my failures, regardless of my sin, when I come back to you, you work all things together for good. All right? You guys, let me tell you. If you are a son and daughter of God, you will be attacked spiritually, one way or another. All right? He knows exactly where to hit you. He's powerful. He knows exactly what will get you to compromise. He knows exactly what will get you to lie. He knows exactly what will get you to uh, be angry and be bitter. He knows exactly when to hit you, when you're most tired, when you're most like mentally out of it, when you're physically lost, when you're basically so emotionally discouraged. He knows exactly when to hit you. He knows exactly how to hit you. But, but you have an armor that you can put on, right? A commitment to truth. Can we do that? Can we, can we actually commit to truth? That's hard. I know some of y'all just tell lies like, like it was nothing. Like you say, like you tell lies so much that you believe that your lies are truth sometimes. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a true story, you know? You can convince yourself your, your lie is true after a while because you told it so many times, right? Are you committed to righteousness, that you've been given a breastplate of righteousness to act right even when everyone else around you is acting wrong. To do the right thing even when the people around you is doing the wrong thing. Are you committed to making peace when everyone else around you is basically screwing you over, messing with you, hurting you, abandoning you, right? betraying you? Are you still committed to make peace? And the only way to do that is what? It's having that shield of faith. Trusting in the goodness of your God. Trusting in the goodness of your God. And so here at Missions, our mission, uh, our mission, you know, like, that was day two of Missions, okay? Like, basically, everyone knocked out was day two. Okay, we had a long, long mission left. And we were just just thinking, what's going on? Right? And there, were, there, was, there was tension in the group, right? People were angry with each other. You know, like if you're getting sick, you're in a room with each other for like a couple of weeks. You know, you're, you're seeing each other every day. You're sharing bathrooms together. Girls and bathrooms just don't mix for some reason, right? The bathrooms together, right? You're, you're doing things together and just tensions begin to happen, right? You want, you, you want to do everything possible to have like this, this bitterness, this envy that begins to pile up, Right? This desire to lie sometimes, you know? Desire to act unrighteously. But you know what happened? We pushed through. You know? With prayer, we got together in our team. We prayed through it. You know, we addressed the issue. This is a spiritual battle. We are the pioneering team of TLC. If we were not attacked, there, would, there, there might have been an issue with our, with our missions, right? If we, if we got through this missions perfectly, there might have been some sort of issues happening, 
that we didn't know. But the fact that we were attacked dramatically, right, to a point where, like, it was funny. Everyone was saying, you know, the last person to go is you, Pastor Tony. If you go, that's it. You know, like, everyone was knocked out one by one. It's like, you know, that's it. You know, Pastor Tony goes, that's, that's the end of the mission, you know. It's like, it's just, he's the last one, right? And we're, we're just praying through it. We're just, you know, we're just like, Lord, we have no idea what's happening, but we trust that you want us here. We trust that you have called us as a church to go on missions. We have no idea why everyone is having just constant, constant run. We have no idea why everyone's fevers is in this huge level. And we have no idea why when we need certain people the most, they were the ones that were knocked out. We have no idea. Right? But we do know that you're good. That you are good. And we're going to push through it. And we did. Right? And by the time, you know, mission came, finished through, everyone, everyone was up. You know, I mean, we weren't like 100%, but we, we, we got through it. We got through it, right? And the next few days, the next few weeks, um, I'm going to have a lot of them share with you their stories of what's going to happen, right? But imagine that, right? This is, this is how I, this, I was thinking about this last night. This is how we know that TLC is meant to go on missions, is that we were so badly beaten <laughs> on the mission field, right? It was. This is how we know. And this is how you know, you guys, that you walk in the right way, is that you begin to encounter all these spiritual attacks in your life. Because the devil doesn't want you to do what's right. He wants you to do exactly what's wrong. And the fact that when, you, when nothing's happening in your life, you should be questioning what are you doing with your life, right? Is not my life in such a way so opposite of what the devil wants and what the schemes of Satan wants that he actually wants to take me out of this? Every spiritual act that you begin to walk towards God the devil's going to do everything possible to discourage you, to stop you, to make it from happening. And if you see none of that happening in your life, there's a good indication in your life that you're not walking towards God. Right? So I had a buddy, I had a buddy who, you know, just came to faith and that, you know, uh, a lot of things happened. And like, you know, just came to faith and you're starting really new in faith, really young as a, as a, as a, as a believer. And then what happens? Right? He ends up losing his home. Right? Had every person, like, like, that's the one way to, like, you know, discourage someone is, hey, I have nowhere to sleep. Huge problem, right? I just came to, I just came to faith in Christ, thought things were going to go good for me, and then, bam, lost my home. What just happened, right? That's how you know you're going the right way. Continue to go that way. Don't back down. Don't get discouraged. Don't stop. Put on the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, put on the shoes of faith, or sh- shoes of peace, put on the shield of faith, right? Helmet of salvation. Trust that God who started the good work in you, he will see it to completion. You follow? Okay? The devil is after you. The struggle is real, no doubt. Okay? The struggle is real. But you are not left alone. Okay? You are not left alone. Let's pray. Let's come to, for the Lord and let's uh, spend some time in, as a response to him in prayer. Um, let's, let's just begin to, you know, examine our hearts. Can we start with that? Can we examine our hearts? Lord, where, where, where has my walk with you been, Lord? Have I, been, have I committed my life so desperately and so completely to you that I see all these attacks coming my way? Or have I been just coasting through my spiritual walk in life? Have I just been merely coasting that I don't see anything happen? Because honestly, I'm not a threat to anyone, especially to Satan. That maybe somehow I've actually been rendered useless. That somehow I've actually been in a spiritual coma. Right? It's time to pray, you guys. Examine your heart. What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with the gifts that God has given you, the time that God has given you, the resources that God has given you, the energy that God has given you? Are you moving for his kingdom? Are you working for his kingdom? Are you merely coasting by? And you know, you know when you begin to work for his kingdom because why? Attacks come. Attacks come when you're tired. Attacks come when you're feeling low or down. Attacks come to get you to lie, to get you to act unrighteously, to get you to uh, 
be envy, angry, bitter with your friends, with church brothers and sisters, with people. You know those things, right? So examine our hearts. Let's begin this prayer. I said, Lord, I know and I see where I'm at. Oh God, would you help me? Would you help me to begin my battles with you? To walk, oh Lord, towards you. To fight for the things that you desire. To hunger for the things that you want. To face whatever arrows come my way. To stand strong, oh God. Because I know that you are good. Let's come before the Father. Let's just pray for that in our lives and our hearts. Let's pray. Yes, Lord. That is my prayer, oh God, for TLC. Oh, that we will resist the schemes of Satan, God. That we will not be useless in the kingdom of God. That we will not be rendered useless to this work that is to come. That, Father God, as Christians, as followers of you, Lord, that we will be more than just empty shells, oh God. But we will be soldiers advancing the kingdom, advancing your kingdom. Soldiers who will fight. Soldiers, Father God, who will take your cause and run with it. Soldiers, Father God, who will stand up against any battles, any situation, any schemes, any power that comes our way, oh God. Soldiers, oh Lord, that will not back down. Father, I pray over our church, God. Give us the heart, Father God, to examine ourselves. Help us to examine our actions and our thoughts. Help us to examine where we're at spiritually, physically, emotionally. Help us to examine, Father God, our life. Lord, where are we going? What are we doing? What is our action? What is our thoughts? What is it that you're calling us to, O Lord? What is it that you're willing from us, O God? Second, let's pray for this. Let's ask, um, let's ask the Lord, God, whatever comes my way, help me not to, tr- to, help me not to doubt in your goodness. Whatever pain, whatever struggles, whatever ailment, whatever hurt, whatever emotional battles, whatever spiritual battles, whatever physical battles comes my way, help me not to doubt in your goodness. Help me to trust your word that you who have died for me, you will continually, continuously see me through to the end. That you will not abandon your child. That whatever pain I go through, you will use it for good. Whatever hurt that I go through, you will use it for good. Whatever things that that comes my way, help me to not doubt that you are there watching, guiding, and leading me towards something greater. Let's come before the Father. If there's any doubt in your heart, you know, in any areas of your life, can we just come, can we lay, just lay that down before God? And we, can we begin to say, Lord, help me to trust. Teach my heart to trust. Convict me, oh God, by your spirit to lay, and tr- lay down my, my own selfish ambitions and to trust in what you have in store for me. Let's come before the Father. Let's pray for that right now. Let's pray. Father God, I pray. I pray, oh God, that with through every situation in our lives, that we will not doubt in your goodness. Whatever pain may come our way, that we will not doubt in your goodness. Whatever struggles will come, may come into our lives, we will not doubt in your goodness. That we will trust you to the end of our days. And until our last breath, until we stand before you once again, we will trust in your goodness. So use us, Father God. Speak to us. Awaken us, Father God. Help us to stand firm and strong against the enemy's schemes, against the devil's plots, against the work of Satan. Yes, Lord. And so, Father God, this is our prayer this afternoon. Lord, help us to examine our hearts, O God. Give us spiritual eyes to see if we are walking, Lord God, if we are are spiritually in a coma or not, O Lord. Have we been rendered useless in your kingdom? And if we are, Father, I pray that you would do whatever is necessary to wake us up. I pray, O God, that we will be a church 
of sons and daughters that will not just sit by watching the world go by, but we will be active soldiers in your kingdom. That we will help in every way and every how possible to advance your work in whichever ways that you have called us specifically. It could be to missions. It could be to a ministry that you have made us, made us um, passionate about. Whatever it is, oh God, help us to not give up, but to advance it, to continue to walk it, regardless of the struggle, the stress, the pain, the hurt. But I pray that you would just guard us, guard us with your spirit, guard us with the promise that you are good to us. Guard us with the promise that you who began a good work in us, you will see it to completion. That we do not have to lie to get ahead. That we will stay with our lips speaking truth because you are good. That we don't have to compromise our integrity, oh God. But that we will trust in you. That you will work out things well for us. That we will not, Father God, have to act with envy or bitter or hate or unforgiveness in our hearts because, oh God, we trust that you have the ability to change souls. And so, God, we come before you. We ask, Father God, for the spirit of trust. Help us to battle against Satan's schemes. Help us to overcome the struggles, oh Lord, of spiritual life. Help us, Father God, to live a life vibrant and not useless. To be alive and not in a coma.